For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are, of course, aware that we are not going to be able to work our way into heaven. There's no way for us to earn it or merit it. Salvation is, of course, and that ultimate home with God is something that we receive by the grace of God. However, what we recognize here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, is that God, having saved us, has saved us in order to walk in good works. Salvation, as we have pointed out before, is not merely going to heaven when we die. Salvation is God redeeming us and changing us and making us into new people. Those new people, of course, go to heaven and are with God for all eternity. But he has saved us unto good works in order to walk in good works, in order to be good working people. And we understand That Paul, as he wrote to Titus, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 14, that we are supposed to be people who are devoted to good works. People who are careful in order to, to promote and be involved in good works. The thing that God wants us to do in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we learn that one of the things we're supposed to do is to provoke one another to love and good works. In fact, One of the reasons we're supposed to assemble together like we're doing right now is that we might be an encouragement and provocation to one another in order to pursue love and good working. Now, as we do that sort of thing, sometimes when we gather here and we open up the Word of God, we are very much at a very high level looking at some, not theoretical things, but, you know, the more spiritual overarching principles. But every once in a while, what we need to do is kind of drill down and get down to some very specific things. And recognizing that Jesus and his grace in our life is supposed to impact us across the board in everything that we are doing, I want us to drill down to something that maybe we don't think about quite as often. Not as much as preachers used to think about it, I think. Because I realize it's been about six years. I realize the last time I talked about this passage in a sermon, my daughter, who's now 15, was nine. And I thought, we need to talk about this passage again because we're looking in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, as Steve read just a moment ago, and I need to get over to 1 Timothy 2, not Ephesians 2. I already read that one. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I desire then that in every place men should pray, lifting holy hands, without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Here in these three verses we are focused on good works. And notice that it talks about being dressed with good works the way we dress the way we dress has something to do with the good works that we are supposed to be provoking one another toward and which we walk in because we have been changed by jesus christ normally of course when we talk about this we highlight the word modesty and we've many of us have heard lots of sermons on modesty i mean i know if i ask for a show of hands a lot of us we oh yes i've heard lots and lots of sermons i've preached sermons on modesty And I know that what preachers, what we tend to do when we talk about modesty is is trying to establish lines. How how short is too short, how low is too low, how tight is too tight, uh, all those kinds of things. I, I realize that as I look at what Paul said, he didn't do that. He didn't feel the need to do that. What he did was he provided some good works principles, some heavenly thinking. Some things that we need to have in our mind that as we open our closets and we pull out the clothes and we decide what am I going to wear today, i got to have the right mindset. Otherwise, it actually doesn't matter how long or short or tight or, or ostentatious or shiny. It, it just doesn't matter if I don't have my mindset in this right place that we find in this passage. So I want us to think about this idea of being dressed with good works. Now, of course, as we deal with this, I understand here in 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 through 10, that 
Paul focuses this point toward our sisters. And oftentimes what we do is we just say, now, now, you know, look, we know, we know that he says it to the sisters, but he's, he's meaning this for both of them, and then we just move on. I do want to look at this passage just real quick and understand why we can say that. Notice in verse 8 where he begins. He says, I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. Lifting what kind of hands? Holy hands. Hands that are involved in holiness. Hands that are involved in doing what kind of things? What kind of deeds? What kind of works? Good works. Paul, as he gets to this point in his letter... He turns to the men and says, I want you guys to be praying with hands that are full of doing good things. That's what he's saying here. Don't don't lift your hands to God in prayer thinking that if that week you've been punching your neighbor in the face, shedding blood with your hands, that your prayers are going to be heard. He says, what I want is for the men to be busy doing good things with their hands And if they're doing that, when they turn to God and lift those hands in prayer, those prayers will be worth something. And then he says, likewise, and he turns to the sisters. He says, likewise, I want the sisters to be dressed with modesty. I I want them to be dressed not in braiding of hair and gold and jewelry. He says, but instead with those who are doing what is right for those who are professing godliness with good works. See, the fact is, Paul is making the same point twice in a row. I I think, though, we do have to come to grips with the fact that what Paul demonstrates is that he turns to the men and says, you guys, quit being violent. And I think probably he says that because, guys, we are the ones that are more likely to be physically violent. That's not saying that women nowhere, anywhere, ever have been physically violent. That's not saying that. But his point is he understands this is a point that the men are more likely need to hear. You know, what I find funny is nobody ever gets to this verse and says, now the women are allowed to be violent. Nobody ever says that. I don't know why. Because we all get upset about the next verse and say, what about the men? Both of these verses are for everyone, but what Paul is demonstrating is that there's a tendency that we have. And let's just face it, when it comes to the struggles that brothers have, we are the ones that are much more likely to have that kind of physical violence, that, that kind of approach. And he says, I don't want you doing that. I want you lifting holy hands. Now, the kind of improper interaction between brothers and sisters that it seems that can cause a problem more for sisters than for brothers is this kind of competition that takes place, well, in the way we present ourselves, in our dress. I'm going to show myself to be more important because I have more jewelry. I'm going to show myself to be more beautiful because I have the latest hairstyle. I'm going to, and, and what's going on here is the same kind of fighting and fussing and feuding and competing and having interpersonal problems. And he says, look, here's what we need. We need people to dress in ways that profess godliness with good works. And both sides do apply to both men and women. So for the rest of this time, we're not going to make this just about the sisters. But we do remember the way Paul dealt with this. Because these three verses together are saying that all of us are supposed to be professing godliness. And all of us are supposed to be dressing with good works. If we want our prayers to be heard, that's the kind of people we need to be. So let's talk about what that means as we are going to pursue this concept of dressing with good works. Before that, would you pray with me? Holy God, thank you so much for being our God. Thank you for letting us be your people. Father, I pray for all of us here this morning that any who this week were involved in violence, whether physical, verbal, emotional, attitudes, that you would forgive us for that. That we could be cleansed of that kind of anger, and malice, and hatred, and that here as we have gathered together now to bless you, that it will be blessed on the fact, uh, based on the fact that, that we bless those who are created in your image, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors and friends. 
And Father, we also ask that for those among us who have been attracting attention to ourselves for whatever reason, if we've gotten involved in the competitions of trying to present ourselves as better, greater, more than others around us, we ask for forgiveness there as well. We ask that you would help us this morning that we would learn to profess godliness every step of our lives, even down to the very clothes that we wear. And that, Father, we would be dressed with good works. Help us to understand that this morning just a little bit better so that tomorrow morning when we open our closets, it'll impact what we decide to wear to school, to work, around our neighborhoods. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for loving us first. It's through your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Recognize when he talks about being dressed with good works, the first thing that is demonstrated in this passage is he says that that these folks need to be dressed with what is proper for those who profess godliness. For those who profess godliness. Profession is the idea of announcing, promising, proclaiming. The Greek lexicon dictionary by Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, you'll obviously hear, sometimes you'll hear people just refer to that as BDAG. They will say that this profession can sometimes be to give oneself out as an expert. The idea of I am making a proclamation, I am saying something. And he says that what we're supposed to be saying, what we're supposed to be professing, what we're supposed to be proclaiming, what we're supposed to be promising, even in the way we dress, is godliness. Godliness is a word that very literally is the idea of God worship. It's the idea of reverence and piety and devotion. In reverence and piety and devotion, he says we need to dress as people who are professing, not just with our mouths, but even with the clothes that we wear, we are declaring to everyone who sees us, I am somebody who worships God. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, we learn a little bit about worship. Jesus says to the woman that he has met at the well in Samaria, he says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Even the way we dress Here, yes, but even as we leave here, it's supposed to proclaim to the people that we are folks who follow Yahweh God in spirit and in truth. And I know that that truth has the idea of doing things the way God has said. There is truth and there is error. But the other aspect of doing that in truth is the idea of doing it sincerely. What you see is what you get. We're going to leave here and we're going to go act in ways and we're going to go dress in ways when we go to school and when we go to work and when we're going out with our friends. And the question is, is that going to be the same presentation as what we are saying and doing here? We just sang the song, here I am to worship. Is that a profession? Is that an announcement? Is that a proclamation? Is that that where we are saying with our words and our mouths, here's the kind of person I am. I am a worshiping person. I am a person who recognizes that there is a God who has created all things. And I am in submission to him, and I am surrendering to him, and I am the kind of person that worships him. We sang that just a moment ago. Wasn't it great? That's amazing. What Paul is saying here is that tomorrow when we pull out our clothes out of our closet and we're putting them on, we need to be saying the exact same thing by the way we're dressed. Those who dress professing godliness. But then he moves on to good works. He says, here's how you do it. Here's how you profess godliness. By being dressed with good works. What are those? I certainly recognize that at times as we are talking about the good works that we've got to make sure that we're doing, that certainly those kind of works have to do with what we're doing here. Are we doing things the way God wants us to do? Are we, is this congregation doing the kind of work God wants his churches to do? 
Are we worshiping when we are gathered here in the ways that God wants us to worship? All of that is included. But as we're talking about this personal level of dress and approach to life, can you just turn a page or two and get over to 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning at verse 9? In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 9, Paul is talking about, remember, when Paul wrote to Timothy, there was no social security. There were no governmental benevolence programs. There was, there was no safety net for folks in, in, in the empire to take care of them when they no longer could take care of themselves. And so, of course, those who were the most needy at that time would be widows, especially widows if they didn't have kids. And Paul talks about a group of widows that would actually be enrolled with the church. Not, not, just, not just, oh, someone's in need today and we're going to offer some benevolence. We find that sort of thing throughout Scripture. But now he's talking about someone who is in such dire need that they have become enrolled with the church to be cared for consistently ongoing by the church. I think there was some responsibility that these sisters had in the congregation. That's for another lesson. But the idea here is, here's somebody who is, who is in this desperate need and the church is now going to say, this is our role, this is our duty. We are caring for this sister. But Paul says, but you're not going to do that for just anybody. So I, I'd, like, I'd like for you to think of this passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 in light of the fact, even if we just take this from a standpoint of, of kind of backing up and trying to apply some principles about general benevolence from the congregation, just, just thinking in terms, he says, look, if the church is actually going to bring someone into their roles and say consistently, this is, we are going to be con- caring for them consistently, he says, this is the kind of person they're supposed to have been. This is the kind of person they're supposed to have been. And here's what he says, 1 Timothy 5, 19. Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. Good works. This thing that he had said back in chapter 2 about sisters being professing godliness and being dressed with good works, I want you to know here in chapter 5 what he says is, you know, one day if your husband dies and there's not social security and your kids aren't taking care of you and you hope that the church will come alongside you and provide for you and care for you and you be enrolled in that, he says you need to be thinking about this because these are the things that your life has to have been like for that to happen. That's how important this kind of dress is. Reputation for good works. What are some things that are mentioned? If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Brought up children. That is fulfilling the responsibility that is the normal responsibility of mothers and wives in the family. We don't have time this morning to deal with the fact, I don't think Paul is saying that if someone had been incapable of having children, they can never be supported by the church. However, that being said, maybe this passage does tell us a little bit about those who have never been able to have their own children. Maybe there should be involvement with other people's children in this family of Christ, with our nieces and nephews in the Lord, if you will. Brought up children. Then he he goes on to say, has shown hospitality. Now we've moved beyond just the family unit and now looking at the family unit. Shown hospitality. Please understand that while generosity is a part of hospitality, generosity does not equal hospitality. Hospitality is the idea of receiving and welcoming others to ourselves. It's generous to take someone out to lunch. It's hospitable to have them into our home for lunch. It is generous to put someone up overnight in a hotel. It is hospitable to invite them into your home to stay because they need some time to be there. Generosity is a good thing. We need to be generous. We're not saying that we have to be hospitable instead of just generous. Sometimes generosity is what is needed. We need to understand the difference. He says, if she's been hospitable, that's a good work. And then not only hospitable, but washing the feet of the saints. Now that's a level of hospitality that most of us today would would think a little bit beyond the pale. 
I understand, yes, this is dealing with a cultural issue that happened in that day and age. This is not some type of rule that we all have to wash one another's feet. That's not that feet. That's not a cultural thing for us today as it was for them. But the principle behind it is still true. In that hospitality and in that service, it even means doing the things that are self-sacrificial. The things that only the lowest among us we think should have to do. And then caring for the afflicted. James tells us in James 1.27 that pure and undefiled religion is visiting the widows and orphans in their affliction. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus teaches a parable where he talks about the fact that uh, as, he, as he talks to the sheep on his right, he says to the sheep, when I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you came to me and cared for me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. And they asked him, they said, Lord, when did we do this? When did we see you like this? And he says, as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, my brothers and sisters, he says, you did it to me, visiting them in their affliction, being there when they're in need, helping them. Sadly, today, we have a tendency when we see people in affliction to think, oh, they must have done something wrong. God's judging them. That's too bad for them. But that's not what we have here. What we have here is visiting people in their affliction, helping them as, as God's servants of mercy. He says, these are good works. I jump over to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, and a very unfortunate placement there on our slide, but it's Titus chapter 3 and verse 14. Titus chapter 3 and verse 14. Paul said, Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help in cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. What does it mean to be devoted to good works? What does it mean to be dressed with good works? It means to be there when there are needs, when you see people in need, to, to, to be there to help. I can't help but think of Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. When we think about Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. If you've never read Acts chapter 9 and verse 4, you might just hear this good works, but those who have read it before know what those good works were. Y'all recall what she was doing? She was making garments. Do you remember for whom? Anybody remember? Come on, at least a four-year-old out there remembers. I just asked a question. These are those rhetorical questions Andrew said they answer all the time. Who is she making garments for, guys? Widows. Widows. Y'all remember this story? What were her good works? She saw people in need. You know, the interesting thing is, is that in the Jerusalem church, this humongous group of people that who knows how many widows they had, they had a program to help take care of widows that deacons had to be involved in. It sure looks like in this little church here in Joppa, there wasn't a program. There was just a sister who saw widows with an urgent need, and what did she do? She stepped up and she took care of it. And I will point out, even though I know this is not the reason the story is here, I know this is not the reason the story is here. I know the reason the story of Tabitha is here is so that we'll know that we can listen to Peter when he says that Gentiles are Christians. But I, man, I just tell you, as we're reading through Acts, we see James, an apostle and evangelist. He gets killed by the sword, and what do the disciples do? They mourn him, they bury him, they move on. We see Stephen, I think a deacon, but also an evangelist. He gets stoned to death. Are y'all getting a... Y'all seen what happens to evangelists on a regular basis? You can see why this attracts my attention. What do the disciples do with the evangelists that get killed? Well, they mourn them. They're really sad when it happens. But they bury them and they move on. But this sister who made garments for widows, what did they do? Whoa, whoa. We got to stop and do something about this. And Peter comes in and raises this servant dressed with good works from the dead so she can keep doing her work. Think about that. Dressed with good works. We jump back over to Titus. Now in Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, he's talking to the evangelist here. He says to Titus, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Well, what are the good works that he's supposed to be a model of? 
Actually, if we were to step back in Titus chapter 2 and listen to verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-control, sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good. Train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Those are the kind of works he's supposed to be a model of. Sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, not a slanderer, love, faith, purity, all of those kinds of things. Those are the kind of works that he's supposed to model. We flip over to Colossians in chapter 3 and verse 12. Notice the first words here. Put on then. You know what that, that's clothing language. That's clothing. Now we we, we tell, tell the kids, hey, put on your work clothes because we're working in the yard today. Right? Put on your good clothes. We're going out to dinner. Put on your fun clothes. We're going to Bush Gardens. That's put on then. This is, this is clothing language. What does he say? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive He says, this is how you're supposed to be dressed. You're supposed to put off all that other stuff and you're supposed to clothe yourself in these kinds of things. That's what it means to be dressed with good works. To be compassionate people, to be full of humility and kindness and meekness and patience. He says, that's what, put that on. Cover yourself up with that. Clothe yourselves in those kinds of things. And that's what it looks like to be clothed and dressed in good works. And so we bring it all together with this idea of dressed with good works. Dressed with good works. When we're thinking of all these things about professing godliness and our worship of the Lord and and trying to point people to the Lord in the way we dress and and how we live and how we act and being dressed with the good works. I think a passage that might help us understand kind of a principle in our mind to govern as we do this is back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your, what? Your good works. And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Being dressed with good works, it's about shining our light, so that when people see us, instead of seeing us, they see God. One of the absolute favorite things I've ever heard in one of our Bible classes. Going through the Sermon on the Mount. And we were trying to deal with, what's the difference between this one that says, let your good works shine, and later in chapter 6 when he's talking about doing all of our good works in secret. And our brother Rich Gant said, well, I think what we're supposed to see here is the difference between a street lamp and a chandelier. I thought, man, that is, that is just a beautiful picture of understanding this. Because... Street lamps generally are not designed to say, hey, look at the street lamp. Street lamps are, I mean, street lamps are kind of ugly. But what's the point of a street lamp? Here's the street. Here's the way to walk. Here's the way to drive. Here's the direction you need to be going. Now, a chandelier certainly provides light, but a chandelier is designed in such a way that we, we look at the chandelier and say, that's an awesome chandelier. Yes, I can see the room, and that's fantastic, but really, I can see the chandelier. We're supposed to be street lamps. We need to work in a way and dress in a way that says, I want you to see my God, and I want you to glorify and honor him because he is worthy of praise. That's that's why I'm dressed like this, so that you can see him and not see me. And one of the things that this points out is that we need to see this from two directions. When Paul says that people who profess godliness should be dressed with good works, he is saying that we need to work in such a way that people see our work and glorify God and don't see our dress. But he is also saying that we need to dress in such a way that people see what we do and glorify God instead of the way we're dressed. 
And so as we're considering this whole principle about dress, as we're considering this whole principle about being dressed with good works, we need to be dressing in a way that says, when people look at me, they're not going to see me, they're going to see God. And so how am I dressing? Am I dressing in a way that people will look at me and say, look at how wealthy that guy is. Look at how political that guy is. Look at how sexy that guy is. That never happens for me. See, I'm lucky. I don't have to worry about that one. But you may have to. You may have to worry about that. And even if you don't have to really worry about that, if you're trying that, he says, don't be doing that. Look at how fashionable that person is. You know, the reality is, there is even a way to take this in the wrong direction when it comes to our religiosity. And so a chapter later in the sermon in Matthew 6 and 16, when you fast, don't look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. We're not even actually trying to dress in a way that people will look at us and say, look at how religious they are. But we are trying to dress in a way that people actually, instead of seeing us and the way we're dressed, they see someone who is glorifying God. Paul, writing to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 21 through 22 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. He says that all of us are like vessels in a house, and some of the vessels are going to be used for mundane, crude things, but some of them are used for holy, set-apart, sanctified things. He says we need to be those kind of people, those kind of people who have been cleansed of what is dishonorable so that we will be used by God for what is honorable and what is holy. I finally figured out for, for the longest time, I will, look, this is just me, when I would come to someone's house and they'd have a sign on the wall that says, take your shoes off, it irritated me. It bugged me. I don't know why. I didn't know why. I didn't know why, but it did. I finally realized why, because I remember as a kid, I would get in trouble. If dad said, you need to take the trash out, and I said, hold on, I don't have my shoes on. And my dad, you need to be ready to work. When I tell you it's time to work, you need to be ready to get to work. Dressed for work, son. Be dressed for work. Okay, Dad. I finally realized that's the problem. If you have your sign that says take your shoes off, it's okay. I, I, I'm not bothered by that anymore. <laughs> After years of therapy, <laughs> being able to talk through it with you, I'm now okay with that. But it hit me. You know what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying that we need to be always dressed for holiness. Dressed to be able to do the work of God. Dressed to be the kind of person that when there's an opportunity to talk to somebody about God, God, you're not looking down at the message that's on your t-shirt and realizing, I, I shouldn't be the one saying this. I shouldn't have to apologize for this thing I've got on my shirt here and then, and then trying to tell someone about Jesus. Or I shouldn't have to apologize about what's being revealed from my shirt or from my shorts or in order to talk to someone about Jesus. I need to, need to be dressed for the work of the Lord. And so when I'm dressed, what, what does my dress show people that I'm pursuing? Does it show them that I'm pursuing peace and love and righteousness and faith? Or does it show people that I'm pursuing youthful passions and sensuality and immorality? Wealth and materialism. What does it show them that I'm pursuing? Because I need to be dressed for the Lord's work at all times. And then in Romans chapter 13, verses 12 through 14, Paul says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. There's our dress language. This time it's more than just clothes. It's not just, hey, get to work. It's the fact that we're fighting a battle. We're at war. And there's an enemy who is attacking us. 
and attacking the people that are around us. And he says, this is how you need to be dressed. You need to be dressed as those who have on armor of light in order to fight this battle. He says, so let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. How, how are you dressed? Are you dressed in a way that it's trying to make provision so that your physical lusts and passions can be satisfied? Or are you wearing the Lord Jesus Christ? I understand that, that none of this is about having a particular uniform or a particular style of dress. None of this is about saying that we all have to go around and try to look as ugly as we possibly can. I, I think that would deny that passage about fasting. But what it does say is that when I put my clothes on in the morning, I need to ask, looking at the length, the fit, the style, the fashion... When I go to work today, when I go to school today, are people going to see Jesus or are they going to see me? Because what they need to see is Jesus. And sometimes they may look at us and say, you're weird. Why would you wear those kind of clothes? And Peter tells us to always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us. I'll tell you why. Because my hope is not in attracting people to me. It's in the life that is to come in Jesus Christ. And I'm dressing for that. Dressed with good works. How are you doing at that? If you'd like to, you can put your notes away in your Bibles. We're going to sing a song. And as we sing this song, our goal with this song is for everyone who is here to think about Jesus for whom we dress. The goal of this song, honestly, is not for you to think about what kind of clothes you've been wearing and, you know, if you decided it didn't measure up to this sermon, you need to come forward and tell everybody and apologize. That's not it. Honestly, if you look at your dress and you realize it's not been what we've talked about today, just go home and change clothes. That's, that's what we need you to do. But... If you're thinking about the Jesus, the Savior, the King, the Lord of the earth who created us, who has recognized the wickedness and the filth with which we have been covered, and who went to the cross to die so that that filth could be removed, and we could be dressed in his holiness and in his holy garb, in pure vestments, clothes, cleansed, made spotless by the blood of the Lamb. If you want that kind, of purity and holiness, the kind that comes from God. We want to help you with that this morning. We want to help you enter Jesus Christ and let him remove all the filth of the sin in your life. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. If we can help you with that this morning, won't you please come right now as we stand and sing.